Well, thank you so very much. It's a great honor to be here, and thank you to the Odd Fellows to be able to come to this gorgeous venue, such an historic site. I'm very pleased to be here. And also to Shaw Cable, who's filming tonight. This wasn't originally in the equation, uh, but here they are, and I'm very pleased, very pleased to get this story out that I would like to share with you tonight. Well, that's great to have you all here. As Beck was saying, I've come up with a new book, Claiming the Land, and uh, I'll be talking about that a little bit tonight, but what I wanted to share with you is this topic, British Columbia, the need for a more inclusive story. Now, I've been a bit of a techno-peasant in my life, and I'm afraid that I, I don't have a snazzy clicker, so I'm going to be using this. We'll make it work. Let me give you a little bit of background about me, perhaps. Uh, many of you know that my own family uh, arrived here in what would become British Columbia in 1858. They were Cornish miners. They came via California, were in that <coughs> rush, and up to British Columbia in 1858, here in Victoria. Imagine that. It seems like ancient history, but, you know, what is it? This year, 161 years ago. 161 years ago, Fort Victoria still stood here in Victoria. And uh, my great-great-uncle in particular uh, uh, went on to become quite a significant road, road builder uh, in the province. Uh, he was the foreman of the Dudney Trail, if you uh, know your BC history. Uh, uh, he worked on uh, sections of the Caribou Wagon Road. He built the trail to the Big Ben Gold Rush, some of the early roads on the island, in fact. So I just mention that because when I was a young person, um, of course, I soaked up all this family history and these stories with regard to the gold rush. And uh, being a bit of a bookish uh, sort, of course, I read everything I could get my hands on with regard to this event, this amazing gold rush. And as time went on with my research, my view of things began to change. Let's just start off here. It seems to me that I am typical of many of the non-native public, for sure, the non-indigenous public. My mind was only as good as the kind of books I read and the stories my family shared with me. And again, as I began to research the Fraser River Gold Rush of 1858, and especially once I started looking in archives, south of the border, down in Washington and Oregon, California and beyond, I started to find a very different story, a story that seemingly clashed with what had been the typical story, the old story, that is the romance of the 1858 gold rush. My father, an engineer, when I was very young, used to take me up the Fraser River, up the Thompson River to places like Ashcroft where he was working. And of course, along the way, I don't know, maybe I was 9, 10, 11 years old, He'd be telling me, of course, about Simon Fraser, David Thompson, the early explorers. I remember the first time driving past the little community of Yale. Yale, that many of you will know, was the center of this rush. And these stories of paddle wheelers and saloons and gambling dens, I mean, this just really uh, struck my fancy. And in my youth, too, I used to like to go out and uh, try my hand at a bit of gold panning. Um, so this is what I grew up with, very much so, this romance of the gold rush. And as I say here, you can read it for yourself. Does this come off? May I do this? Uh, I'm going to do that. That's easier. Because <laughs> I kind of like to wander around a bit, actually. Gold rushes have become one of the most explored topics in history, usually romanticized as free-spirited, golden age of opportunity played out on European frontiers. And to sum up that last line, everyone could be involved. Everyone would join these rushes. Let me jump ahead here and give us a little context. 
This is a bit of a slap dab map I put together when I was chief curator uh, for the Royal BC Museum's Gold Rush exhibit. And they were saying, gee, can you create some sort of map to give us an idea, right? So this was the draft map. It's not perfect, of course, but it quickly highlights these amazing transnational gold uh, seeking populations. Many of you undoubtedly know, of course, we had the California Gold Rush of 1849, followed by the Australian Rush, 1852, and then the third great mass migration of gold seekers in search of a new El Dorado, if you will, was in fact the Fraser River Gold Rush. It's 40 years before the Klondike of 1898. So look at this. We've got every, every uh, race and ethnicity under the sun. We have Latin Americans moving around. Look at the Chinese are in these rushes. Americans, Europeans, and this, oh, when this happens, we're not having an earthquake, that's just me, okay? Um, okay, so this just gives you a bit of a snapshot of what was going on in the 19th century. We have records for people who were both in the California rush, over to Australia, over to the Fraser, later up to the Yukon, some of my own family members, in fact. <clears throat> And just to bring it a little closer to home, a bit more context, to situate the Fraser River rush. Let's remember there was an earlier very small gold rush up at Haida Gwe in uh, 1851. This served as something as a dress rehearsal for Governor uh, Douglas and what would unfold in a much larger scale later on. And many of you know the Leech River gold rush, Wild Horse, the Caribou, of course so on and so forth. But it is the Fraser Rush that rushes in here so hugely and transforms this landscape. Okay, with these uh, lights, these old maps don't uh, work too well. But let's remember this. The 49th parallel at this time wasn't even marked out on the ground. It's true that the Oregon Boundary Settlement of 1846 had established the 49th parallel as the new divide between American interests and British interests, right? But in the time of this mass migration of gold seekers, nothing was laid out on the ground, and we'll come back to this in a moment. Well, this is the iconic image, really, of the BC Gold Rush, painted by the artist William Hind. This is, this is deposited at the uh, British Columbia Archives, actually. And what I want to do quickly is just, again, to give it the sort of flavor that I grew up with, this lovely notions of uh, the romance of the gold rush. Never was there so large an immigration in so short a space of time into so small a place, so said Alfred Waddington of Waddington Alley and other fame. So, Traditionally, we say that at least 30,000 gold seekers came in in the relatively short space of six months to a year. The truth is, we just don't know. Think about it. There's no uh, civil authority here at the time when these huge numbers start coming in. And part of the problem is, is while we have shipping records that show uh, the early passenger ships coming up, we haven't got as uh, good a bead on those who took these inland corridors through the American Canadi Canadian Okanagan route that came in. Some contemporary accounts of the time suggest it could have been as much as 100,000, if you can believe that. I'm not so sure about that myself, but in any event, a huge rush. Now, the lighting doesn't do this justice. Here is a broadsheet published in San Francisco in 1858 gives you a little bit of a flavor of things. By 1858 in California, all that placer gold, free gold had largely been mined. The economy had started to switch to more labor and capital intensive concerns. And so for these old sourdoughs, these old 49ers who had crossed the continent, they kind of got underemployed, hanging around San Francisco, waiting for news of the next great gold strike, then a little bit of evidence comes in. Maybe a newspaper report from Washington Territory. Maybe somebody got a letter with a little sample of Fraser River gold dust in it. 
And as more and more news comes of the Fraser River, this frenzy, this excitement builds to the point, I wish you could see that better, that every ship, no matter how dilapidated, sailing vessels, steamboats, whalers, all uh, just stuffed to the max with people desperate to be the first up here to stake their claim. Another reason why we don't know the full figures for the Fraser River Gold Rush. So many of these vessels were over capacity, by far, by far, just stuffed. Okay, here's the other thing in researching the Fraser River Gold Rush for the early rush in the US. It's always spelt with a Z, you'll notice. Maybe that's why it's taken 160 years to get to the bottom of this story <laughs> I'm about to share with you. Here's another William Heim painting. A marvelous thing is now going on here that will prove one of the most important events on the globe, Abraham Lincoln's future Secretary of War. Why have I got that there? Because you know, when I was a kid, oh, the Fraser River Gold Rush, yeah, sure, it led to the founding of British Columbia, but this was an event much larger than I think most of us realize. Again, the third great mass migration of gold seekers. And, as I note here, at the height of the rush north, what would become known as British Columbia actually threatened, briefly, to, to replace California in, uh, as a new El Dorado. Such was the intensity of the rush. I'm just giving you a bit of flavor here. We're very fortunate in the BC archives to have a full leather-bound volume of the San Francisco Bulletin newspaper. Uh, it's so nice not to have to look at microfilm to be able to leaf through each and every page. I read uh, the San Francisco Bulletin uh, for the entire year of 1858. Well, what you find at the height of rush is that it is full of advertisements all about the Fraser River. In fact, you couldn't sell anything unless it was labeled Fraser River during this, uh, this frenzy, if you will. Got the gold feeder, fever and bound for Fraser River, right? Lots of shops in San Francisco, perhaps thinking that the writing was on the wall, were packing up and moving here to Victoria. We have some other examples. Of course, what, gold, what kind of gold rush have you got without alcohol, I suppose, right? Fraser River. Fraser River uh, wine and beer and well here we have a handbook just published this guide to the new gold fields with a compendium here of Chinook jargon very interesting how many of you know about Chinook jargon a few of you right so this was the trade language born out of the earlier maritime fur trade of the 18th century still being used here we'll probably get back to that in a moment this book apparently sold 3,000 copies in just three days in San Francisco in the year 1858. Let's take a moment and look at these place names. What swept in in a single space of one year, totally relabeling the Fraser River landscape. This landscape full of indigenous peoples. We know from the archaeological records, certainly, we have evidence for eight to 10,000 years easy through these corridors here. But in the space of one year, look at these names. Washington Bar, Trafalgar Bar, right? Texas Bar, Ohio Bar, Sacramento, Yankee Doodle, 5440, or fight. This is what sweeps in to this landscape in that year. But it's now Try to take a little different view here for a moment. Here's this piece. It's actually color, the original. It's in the, uh, uh, at Yale University in the archives there. Because you see, it was indigenous peoples who were the discoverers of gold in what would become British Columbia. It was indigenous peoples who were mining the gold prior to this rush, trading it, with her trade partners of long standing, the Hudson's Bay Company. And this story has taken just a little too long to get out. In fact, on the mainland, I mentioned Haida Gwaii earlier, there was a small gold rush there. 
Wish we had time to talk about that. But on the mainland, it was near the Nokomon Falls, just off highway number one, so between Lytton and Spence's Bridge, if you know the country. These are some uh, lovely photographs uh, taken around 1870 from the top of the falls. It's an extraordinary place. It was said within the uh, indigenous histories of the area that prior to 1858, the top of the waterfall was the home and place where a Neklakatmuk shaman apparently foresaw the coming of the white man and how their world would change. I talk about this in my book. But this location also had the very first gold discoveries right here, just south of the, uh, it's, this is at the confluence with the Thompson, a little hard to see in this light. Just below here is where gold was first discovered, uh, which ultimately led to this rush. Now again, such a rich, ancient territory. How many of you uh, have been to Hell's Gate? Most of you, right? Look at this extraordinary drawing from 1859. Look at all the salmon racks here, right? It's amazing, you know where the tram is today. And this is one of the things about the gold rush, outside of the notions of the romance that I grew up with. Because mining can be very destructive, you know. While we have pictures of these individual miners coming in with the pans, in fact, little known to most of us, at least 21 separate water companies came up from California, reestablished themselves on the Fraser with names like the Santa Clara and American Water Company, the Ohio Ditch Company, so on and so forth. And these were hugely elaborate labor-intensive concerns. We can still see the evidence uh, of this today. Building huge flumes and ditch works, miles and miles long, to carry water down to the banks of the Fraser River. Because, of course, you need the water to wash the ground, right? So, they, you know, these 30,000 weren't just a bunch of old sourdoughs coming in. There were some pretty big interests that swept into British Columbia at this time. And, of course, let's not forget that the rush was very multicultural. We have indigenous peoples discovering the gold, mining the gold, right? They were in the majority on the, uh, the gold rush bars. Maybe I should uh, also just clarify, when I'm talking about bars here, I'm no longer talking about saloons. I'm talking about the sand and gravel bars, you know, the choice ones that would uh, appear when the Fraser's low, these way that they would mine, these golden sands. And uh, along with <clears throat> others coming out of California, some of the very first Chinese, of course, not direct from China in 1858, that would come later, but up from California. But add to this list, we know there's Chileans, Mexicans, Hawaiians, the list goes on of people that entered this Russia in that year. So this is one of the objects of my new book, to tell to give a fuller treatment to the Fraser River Gold Rush, a fuller treatment to the actual founding of this place called British Columbia today. And so a few years ago, uh, we came out with a documentary called Canyon War, as Beck kindly uh, noted, has been running on PBS and APTN and Knowledge Network more locally, to get this story out. So we, we deemed it to be very important. And Canyon War, is really the centerpiece of this history of the gold rush. I talk about other things in claiming the land. I talk about things uh, such as uh, the fact that Britain uh, was about ready to pull out of Central America, but for the F Fraser River gold rush. They stayed in uh, areas like the Mo uh, Mosquito Protectorate. They wanted to still control the isthmus. Right, this, uh, this ticked off the American government hugely. I could go on about that, but you can read about it in my book if you so desire. The Fraser River War. When I first started researching this, it wasn't to be found in the colonial record. No, it wasn't at all. When I started going south of the border, of course, where did these miners send their letters? Where were their diaries? 
Most of them are south of the border and they tell a decidedly different story of what occurred in this year. And I'll have to paraphrase a little bit here, but as more and more newcomers came into this space and were competing for the, uh, the resources of the Fraser, the gold and whatnot, and as more and more of these huge water companies were digging up uh, the countryside, draining the lakes to bring water down to the Fraser, this ultimately affected the salmon fishery, the very lifeblood of the indigenous peoples. So what happened? The Neklakatmuk people, previously known as the Thompson River people, just so we get our bearings, essentially blockaded the river. They forced all of these foreign-born miners out of the area ultimately and quite decisively so. Bodies of headless miners were found floating down the Fraser River. We're going to look at a bit of this evidence here. And they came down all the way past Yale, here we are at Yale, to the point where hundreds and hundreds, thousands of miners congregated at Yale, all getting pushed out from beyond Lytton, back down to Yale, their little safe haven of the 58 gold rush. And in typical sort of frontier American democracy, they voted their military leaders to author office. <clears throat> These miners' militias formed at Yale to go out and fight, in many instances, the indigenous peoples. One of them we're going to talk about quickly, hopefully, is uh, Captain Graham of the Whatcom Guards. And like many other four miners coming up, they came with them across this unmarked 49th parallel, not only with the requisite pick, pan, and shovel, they came with a, a, a mindset which could be summed up quite quickly as a good Indian is a dead Indian. There are a number of militias that form to leave Yale and have engagements with indigenous peoples. At Spasm, well, we'll get to this shortly, Captain Snyder, who was a special correspondent for the San Francisco Bulletin, had a plan that was largely endorsed by the majority of these miners, and that was to see if he could make peace. But he was opposed at times by this other captain, Captain Graham, who wanted to go out and kill all indigenous peoples, men, women, and children. So I, talk, I go into intimate detail on the Canyon War and how that unfolded. And I did so in part because it's a story that had never been told. Surely this has got to be one of the great untold stories of British Columbia I'm sharing with you right now. Oh, we don't have any, many pictures from the year 1858. And so these miners came in very quickly and most of them went home. But here's one who didn't. His name was Edward Stout, Ned Stout. I know his descendants today, lovely family, but Ned Stout, uh, back in that year, was involved in this conflict and uh, would ultimately be forced out from that area that I was showing you earlier of the Nickman Falls. He and his party of about 26 or so uh, were up there and ultimately had to beat retreat all the way back to Yale. Just keep him in mind, we'll get back to him in a moment. The Fraser Canyon War, to understand it more fully, requires placing it in larger context. It's no coincidence that the Indian Wars, so-called, of 1858 in Washington State, east of the Cascades, were occurring at the same time as the Fraser River conflict. Now, they're intimately connected. And why is that? Well, first of all, let's just remember that Governor Isaac Stevens in Washington Territory had brought together these treaty councils. He did a whirlwind of activity all through eastern Washington, treaties that uh, were not ratified by U.S. Congress till later. And so he also not only inaugurated these treaties with indigenous nations, he also, uh, by governor's decree, banned 
that any white people should go east of the Cascades at this time. Uh, partially because these treaties hadn't been confirmed and also, it's pretty, it's not an earthquake, uh, because you can offer uh, people protection. Now, in 1858, while we often focus on the maritime routes of communication, out of San Francisco to here in Victoria or Bellingham Bay, port towns and these other competing ports, again, it's these overlanders, these miners coming out of Northern California through Oregon, taking the old HBC uh, trail systems, originally indigenous trails, right? Hudson's Bay Company, of course, had a base of operations in Yerba Buena, what would become San Francisco. HBC was such a presence on this coast. And they would take this trail network up the Columbia and through the Okanagan, following the Okanagan River, crossing the 49th parallel, again as yet unmarked, all the way up to Kamloops, down the Thompson River, many of them cutting through uh, places like Marble Canyon around Hat Creek today and coming out on the Fraser River. It is these Fraser River bound miners of Northern California that set off the wars in Washington State. Which nobody really paid any attention to or knew much about on either side of the 49th parallel. And in the process, okay, as a um, they set off these wars. Here's just one example, the Battle of Spokane Plains, September 5th, 1858. In this particular engagement, you had the combined indigenous nations of the Palouse, the Coeur d'Alene, the Yakima, others who defeated Lieutenant Steptoe of the United States Army in this year. Well, you can imagine the repercussions that came from that. In fact, what would happen is ultimately the U.S. would send out 1,500 troops equipped with howitzers. They went in and forced the indigenous peoples into a complete surrender. They torched their grain fields, they killed all their livestock, their horses, ran them into the hills. Can you imagine blasting their howitzers? All of this is going on concurrent with the conflict that unfolds on Fraser River in this year. And so here's Governor Douglas. John Adams is in the room, old square toes, right? John? John Adams. No, John Adams is not old square toes. John? Is that your new nickname? <laughs> Governor Douglas believed that it would require, quote, the nicest tact to avoid a disastrous Indian war. And really all he had was the Royal Navy out on the mouth to fly the British flag. Here's a lovely shot of HMS satellite. Douglas had been warning Britain that war was imminent. Douglas had, he had his druthers had requ requested the military force be sent out by Britain. If he had had his way, he would have kept all four miners out and from crossing the border. The imperial government nixed this idea, um, primarily because they didn't want to get into a conflict with the United States. You know, the 49th parallel had just been concluded in 1846. And that, the Americans acceded to that largely so they could fight their war with Mexico at that time. Britain didn't want a war. So they said basically, no, it's not our policy. Let these foreign miners in. Britain didn't know what the heck was going on. They're on the other side of the world. The only equivalent thing they have in their minds is what had happened in California just south to the south, and the atrocities committed against indigenous peoples. Douglas had been writing to the colonial office about these very matters. And so when they decided to create 
the Crown Colony of British Columbia, it didn't follow any, any uh, colonial land management model like here on Vancouver Island, the Wakefield system, and we could go on about that. It was to do one main thing. The protection of indigenous peoples was the paramount concern in establishing British Columbia. And that was to assert some order and make darn sure that the California experience would not reoccur north of the 49th parallel. The most pressing immediate care in this new colony, argued Lord Lytton, will be to preserve peace between natives and foreigners at the gold diggings. Lytton's predecessor, said, there was one circumstance which constituted the main danger of disorder, and that was the strong aversion which the Indians entertained towards the Americans. That's quite true, actually. We have accounts. For instance, here, uh, I'll share one with you. Here we are in Victoria, formerly Fort Victoria. A uh, gentleman by the name of Roderick Finlayson, of course, had essentially overseen the construction of the fort and was the head honcho here until Governor Douglas would relocate uh, later, in 1849, with the creation of the colony of Vancouver Island. Finlayson, if you look at uh, the, the California historian H.H. H. Bancroft, Hubert Howe Bancroft's interviews he did with many people up here in the 1870s, Finlayson had this to say about Americans in this region. He said that while the Hudson's Bay Company would comfortably travel from, you know, what became BC, New Caledonia, following the old brigade trail all the way back, back down to Fort Vancouver, peacefully, these annual brigades, he said that Americans, uh, 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 in a contrary way, would be shot on sight. Wow, this is pretty heavy, right? Well, why is that? That goes back to the whole Oregon Trail experience, which if I have time, I'm going to talk just a little bit more about that. You've got three big events on this coastline at this time. You've got, you've got, the, or, you've got the Oregon Trail, bringing Americans out to the old Oregon Territory. You've got the California Gold Rush, and you've got the Fraser River Gold Rush, all within a number of years of each other, not too much. Okay, I just threw that in late in the day. Again, just to reiterate, that while the, while the uh, boundary had been decided between Britain and the U.S., other than, uh, you know, places like Point Roberts, uh, it hadn't been marked out anywhere at this time, right? You had many Americans believing, in fact, that the Fraser River ultimately would be found to be south of the 49th parallel. That's what they were hoping for. This little snippet here, Point Roberts, how many of you have been there? A few of you? Well, uh, Whatcom, uh, a lot of American miners would land in Bellingham Bay rather than Victoria, rather than the British port, and they would get to Point Roberts and they would wait. They would wait. They would get news from returning miners coming down the Fraser saying, oh, the gunboat is here, the British Navy boat's here or there and they would wait and then they would make rafts and other things and try to slide up the river past the gunboats, in certain cases try to outrun them. So they wouldn't have to pay this, from their perspective, nefarious tax, the miner's license, which from a British perspective, uh, uh, Governor Douglas warned them to, to acknowledge that this, hey, this is in fact British territory, let alone indigenous territory. So let's just, let's just jump back a little bit before the 49th parallel was drawn. Old Oregon, Old Oregon, the dimensions of which ran from 5440, 5440, 54 degrees, 40 minutes, down to the 42nd parallel, or today's California-Oregon border. This was the fur trade world and the center of it, before Fort Victoria, was, of course, Fort Vancouver, down on the Columbia River. Now, when more and more Americans are kind of taking the overland uh, trail, the Oregon Trail, out to the coast, the HBC, many of you will be familiar with this history, perhaps, were encouraging Americans to stay on the south side of the Columbia River, believing earnestly 
that in any future international boundary established that it would run down the Columbia River. That didn't happen. They ultimately could see that Britain really didn't have any interest uh, uh, in enforcing the issue, particularly at that time. So as we know, the 49th parallel was chosen. At one point, Americans even ran it right across the tip of southern Vancouver Island as one of the potential uh, uh, possibilities they were negotiating. But before the Oregon Trail, before Go West, young man, before this period of American expansion, there was this fur trade world out, world out here, this fur trade world. And I want you to just stop and think with me for a moment what it must have been like for Governor James Douglas and his wife, who had spent a goodly portion of their life in Fort Vancouver, what it must have been like to leave their old home and relocate to Fort Victoria, having to pack up, come here, Fort Victoria, built 1843, they're coming up six years later. Governor James Douglas, of course, was a mixed-race Scottish West Indian, married to Lady Amelia Douglas, a mixed-race Irish Cree woman. Now, I bring this up in this moment because of what happened with the ascension of American numbers in the southern half of Old Oregon and with the drawing of the 49th parallel to the coast. There had been a period in which these early American settlers had created a compact of sorts with the Hudson's Bay Company. And that compact was something called the Oregon Provisional Government. And while until Americans' numbers got to such a point, you know, things were going okay, I suppose. But once Americans became in the majority, they essentially took over the Oregon Provisional Government in the sense of they started to pass racist legislation. Now again, think about this fur trade period, this multicultural fur trade period. You know, you've got Hawaiians working here, you've got various indigenous nations, you know. You've got this mix. You've got this custom of the country that various historians have talked about, including John Adams, whereby Scotch, you know, Welsh, uh, Cornish traders were partnering, were marrying with indigenous peoples. By the time of the Fraser River Gold Rush, you've already got a second and third generation of kids. When this would have been yet another great incentive for the HBC to ro relocate to Fort Victoria. Not just the geopolitical system, uh, uh, significance of the loss of that southern territory, but when the provisional government started to bring in res uh, racist legislation such that if you, if you were mixed race, you could not vote. You could not give testimony in a court of law against a white person. It means that if Governor Douglas's uh, daughter, let's say, something, well, if she'd been raped or something, he, by these strict standards, would not have been able to give testimony against a white person himself because of his black blood. I say this because something in the history of gold rushes occurred here that makes it strikingly different. That is, we had a governor and his wife who are of mixed race. And let's remember, too, the British Empire at this point had ended slavery, and they had started to assert a notion of equality under the law. That's why in British Columbia history we have many instances of of uh, our courts, early gold rush courts, where, yes, natives could give testimony, Asian peoples, all sorts against the white individuals. It's a striking difference on either side of the border we have today. And what transpired in Oregon also with the California gold rush a few years later, it would also occur. Could give testimony in a court of law against a white person, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't vote if you were mixed race, 
This is the reason, of course, why our early black pioneers came up to Victoria, one of whom, Mifflin Gibbs, a room of which in the in a new James Bay Library is named in his honor, came up here for equality under the law to escape these, these racist notions that have been unfolding south of the border. It's a very important point to remember. But to get back to the Canyon War, which most people seem to be particularly interested in, as I looked through all the newspapers in California, you know, quite a broad range of sources, it seemed that there was a collision of different mindsets at this time. So you've got the fur trade and you've got these mixed race operations, the custom of the country that have been going on for some time, you know, partnered with their indigenous allies of long standing. And you've got this California conception of things, a good Indian as a dead Indian in many cases. And the press in California, with the discovery of gold along the Fraser River, starts to almost foreshadow that there's going to be war here. I'm not going to read all of this out. And at the same time, Douglas is warning that the Neklakatmuk, Thompson River pieces, uh, uh, peoples, excuse me, were actively protecting their lucrative gold trade, having, quote, taken the high-handed, though probably not unwise course of expelling all parties of gold diggers who had forced an entrance into their country, unquote. Douglas predicted, another quote, that serious affrays may take place between the natives and the motley adventurers who may probably attempt to overpower the opposition of the natives by force of arms. Well, this is extraordinary. Through all this chaos going on, all this warfare going on, that two individuals, just two really, this chap, Captain Snyder, Henry Snyder, and Chief Spintman, ultimately somehow put the lid back on the pot Absolutely extraordinary. And then, we're getting close to the end here. Years ago, I remember poking around Lytton for the first time. And this monument still stands there today. The Spintlam Memorial, as it turns out. Douglas had warned that this conflict would occur. Douglas, again, if he had had his druthers, would have preferred to have kept out all foreign miners south of the border. Douglas was pissed off about what happened to the fur trade and his people and these mixed race families of more than a generation that had essentially got shunted up to the north side of the 49th parallel in places like Fort Victoria. Douglas had always talked about indigenous land and gold in his early text to the colonial office in Britain. What he didn't expect, it seems to me, is that all of these dispatches he wrote would end up being published as parliamentary papers. And when that happened, the Aborigines Protection Society, sort of the watchdog of indigenous affairs in the empire, born of the anti-slavery movement of William Wilberforce and confreres, they got onto this. They could see what he was saying, and they felt that Britain had to do something to ensure that the California experience would not occur here. Well, it did for a time. It did. And its greatest expression was this untold story, the Fraser Canyon War, which I'm sharing with you tonight. And you would think Douglas would have had more to say about this later on, having seemingly almost predicted it, having asked for a military force to be sent out to ensure these things wouldn't happen. And yet, what did he do? He just penned in his diary that there was some problems up on the river and essentially wanted to bring in a ban on alcohol.
And with that sort of, I wouldn't say dismissed it, but certainly buried the issue. Because once Britain had fully cottoned on to what was about to happen here, the great potential for violence that had been predicted, they sent a letter out and they said one thing, British Columbia was founded for one and only one purpose in 1858. Again, that was to ensure that the California experience would not occur here. James Douglas's appointment was provisional and, in fact, the colony of British Columbia was provisional, both for four years, until they would see what would happen, what would happen next, to try and put some semblance of order on this area of the northwest coast, and again, to protect indigenous peoples. But he doesn't talk about it. Probably if he had done so, he would have been severely censured at that point. He undoubtedly would not have gotten his knighthood because the main reason he was ultimately selected as governor is because of his long years in the fur trade, which is to say his long years of working with indigenous peoples and indigenous nations. And this seems so odd because just about everybody else was talking about it. This is an astounding instance of lost history. How can you talk about the founding of Canada's Pacific province without acknowledging just what happened there 160, 161 years ago this year? So, this is the great untold story. And since 1927 at least, there's been this rather mute stone dedication to Chief Spintlam, in which it says, on this chipped off marble plaque, when the white man first discovered British Columbia, the Indians were using the land and this caused bloodshed. David Spintlam did not want this loss of life and succeeded in stopping the war. And you see this fellow here? This is the great, great, great nephew of Captain Henry Snyder who concluded the peace. And we flew him in from Missouri, where he lives. And we had this gentleman, symbolically, he was a great chap, meet with one uh, of the descendants of Chief Spintlam. 160 years later, drinking in the Lytton Hotel at night, just across from the Spintlam Memorial, this was an exceedingly powerful moment to recognize the most significant part of our history here. It's a reminder, too, that while 160 years seems like a long time, it's such a drop in the bucket when you, you think about these ancient peoples living here for thousands upon thousands of years, ancient nations, and that an event like the gold rush could just sweep in and change everything so fast. And then leave a narrative in its trail, which to this day, I would just say, in retrospect, as one who loves the gold rush in one sense, would have to say, we need a more inclusive story for this province. It's absolutely essential. And to quickly conclude, it's essential because all you have to do is look around at the burning issues of things like native land claims, indigenous title, land claims before the courts, a modern day treaty process that lumbers along at a snail's pace, or maybe pipelines that want to be built or not built. All of these issues go right back to this moment I'm sharing with you tonight. And I hope you'll consider reading Claiming the Land, my new book. Um, it goes into much more detail. But I think for, you know, I'm speaking now as a, I'm a colonial, aren't I? My family came with the gold rush. I'm five generations, Victoria. 
the old narratives aren't working so good anymore. We need to find a new one, an inclusive one. We need to repartner again with indigenous allies of old, of long standing during the fur trade period. And so on that note, I'd just like to thank Odd Fellows again for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you about what I believe to be a hugely important issue today. And I'm hoping I've left some food for thought for all of you. Now, before I close, a bit of shameless self-promotion. It is true, Beck said I won this most amazing award. Um, it's been awarded this month. That's great, I feel vindicated. It's like a little uh, seal of approval from the uh, academic community. Um, I appreciate that, uh, more particularly as it will help get this story out more. I'll just say quickly too, the last six months I've been writing for this new online journal, the Orca, a uh, bi-monthly history column if you're into British Columbia history and maybe some untold stories. There's some things to look at there if you go to the Orca website. I have the Daniel Marshall archives. And as I close, thanking you all so much again for coming out tonight.